including the three lectures and other things that I'm writing and I'm, you know, sort of. Well, thank you, but, uh, but it's like a piece of music, you know, it's in a sense there is a certain kind of attitude in a particular piece of music that would lack certain uh, things that one might say, well, this is, piece is terribly dissonant and it, it doesn't, uh, it does not resolve uh, at all uh, and, uh, you know, it sounds like a fragment uh, of, you know. Um, yes, it might be in and of itself, but in a particular suite there may be, you know what I'm saying? But thank you, I appreciate your point. This uh, poetic enterprise, <laughs> this, you know, the gambler's stance and this practice of improvisation, staring down the ab abyss, mm. this is not necessarily um, an argument against God or, or spiritual. In fact, it's um, perhaps a very God-like mm -hmm. <laughs> um, way of being, because maybe the, the universe is a poem, mm -hmm. you know, and, but you have... I notice you have um, avoided spirit because it's troublesome, I think, but um, you've excluded it from your, you know, your argument. Yes, that's a very good point. I have. I don't. I'm trying to think w whether. I mean, I'm, it's not a, a term "spirit" in the particular in the Western tradition is very problematic. Um, so I do avoid it. Uh, uh, now I'm thinking. I'm thinking quickly. <laughs> Generally speaking, I avoid it. It's not impossible. It's not possible entirely avoid it. Uh, but here it wasn't. The, there was the, the the. I guess um, it's a very good point you're making in the sense that I'm not arguing against the spiritual. I'm not excluding the spiritual. But certainly, it's not the language that I want to use. Um, and we can debate that why maybe there is a, an inadequacy not using it and so on. I don't know. But um, yes, from a certain, the, the other thing you said, encountering the abyss, the, encountering the abyss is the quit. It's, that's what religion is about. You know, I mean, in, in any kind of, a, I mean, this is a kind of psychoanthropological uh, explanation for why human societies uh, have developed religion. And it's arguable too. But in any case, one, you know, it's a classic thing to say. It's encountering the abyss, the fact that things are utterly uncertain and the fact that death is impossible to overcome. I mean, this is kind of a, an elementary point. So yes, from a certain standpoint, one might say that my, uh, my argument of encountering the abyss is really a, a, the kind of language, poetic as you mentioned, it's a kind of poetic language that belongs and certainly is very much part of all kinds of religious traditions, at least in their texts and even in their practices, mystical practices and so on. Um, the only difference would be in the sense that um, the, um, and God, you know, the way I'm using it here, I'm working very much within a monotheistic framework, particularly Christian, that too is a strategy. I, I, I mean, it's deliberate that I stayed within that. Um, um, and and uh, I'm not actually speaking about people's experience of what they would call God, okay? And there are all kinds of experiences, you know, the varieties of religious experience, right? Uh, I'm speaking about a, an authoritarian position that can be called God that is posited to be outside our life, our daily life. And this can, doesn't have to be God. It could be the state. It could be a reason. Very important to understand that, I, that my critique would extend to those as well in the same way. Huh? Um, and um, and th at that particular point, then religious experience or religious practices lapse. And what takes their place is actually an occluding of the abyss. It's what actually hide, keeps you from having that encounter because you've got a guarantee. You've got a text that, that says sacred book that has it all. It says it all, and you can just simply follow the commands. Or you have a, a, a particular, uh, you know, you have a, a priest or a cleric who will do it for you, as it were, who takes it upon himself or herself to do it, or whatever it might be. Huh? And, and at, at that point, uh, I definitely differentiate myself. The fact that you use the word poem, perhaps a poem is the living part of language, the most alive part of language. So perhaps the human being is the most alive part of 
what is possible. So if we may perhaps we have to revisit, you know, what God is, because God's a poet, maybe, you know, maybe if human being is a very the most evolved, you know, the most I would prefer poet, you know. I would prefer to say, if we're gonna use that language, that not that God is a poet, but that God is a poem. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it, that, that's to say what human oh, beings... Oh, it's a verb. Yeah. Yes, it's a point. I mean, to use, you know. So another question here. Uh, I think my, my question may have been answered by this discussion a second ago. But you've talked before about um, you living a life without guarantees. Could you just explicate on that by mentioning examples of what you consider to be guarantees, unless it is answered by, for instance, believing in having a religious belief? I mean, does it uh, go as mundanely as, say, the guarantee of the affection of your family, which you may experience, or the security of a job, or the guarantee of whatever? Um, what is a life with guarantees unless... Yes, um, I mean, first of all, I mean, certainly yeah. there's, there's no guarantee to the security of one's job, certainly not in this <laughs> world, <laughs> uh, except for tenured professors, maybe. You know. uh, no, no, of course, I'm kidding. I'm completely kidding. But, uh, um, uh, no, I think my argument would be that even the love and devotion of the, your loved ones is not a guarantee. I mean, in a kind of dogmatic sense. I mean, it is really something that you engage with and that you hope for, because how could you live without hoping for that? It's very, very, very hard, I mean. But you cannot really ever, in, you know, in a kind of, at the last instance, have that as a guarantee, because the moment you do that, in some ways, you, you, take, it, you take away from your family and your loved ones their capacity to love you. You, you basically codify it, it becomes formulaic. You know, they're there for me, and so, you know, then that sort of thing. So, so um, but let's make, a hard, make, make it a really hard case and say, you know, law, of course, that's the hardest one of all. Can we, you know, what does it mean uh, to, to think about living without guarantee in a, in a, in a condition of law? Uh, and here, you know, I mean, I've written and I teach a great deal uh, about anarchy, okay? I, um, um, it's not, I'm not against institutions of law. Uh, but I'm certainly against the institution of law as a disembodied authority, as something that exists and therefore it, we, it must be obeyed. Um, it, it, or that it exists because it must exist because it has, there's never been a society without law. Um, and even if there were to be the case that there's never been a society without law, we have to understand that all laws are made by human beings, by men and women, and that for this reason, there's nothing just or unjust about them in that sense. I mean, there, there are attempts to create justice, and oftentimes produces terrible injustice in the name of law. So, you know, a relationship to law uh, from the standpoint that, that I'm mentioning would be one where not just simply that all law is subject to question, which is the right of every citizen in a democratic policy, it's the duty of every citizen, but even the fact, the question of where does law come from or who authorizes the law must always be under question. So that there's no way that we can settle in comfort zone of the fact that law exists and we're covered because in the end we'd be protected and so on and so forth. Now that, it, so it, that's not to do with religion. I, I'm using that example to, 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 to give you a sense of what I mean. Yes. I mean, that's guaranteed. I am. <laughs> that's a guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sophisticated uh, response. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the concept of law is a guarantee in societies that have uh, uh, raised law to the ultimate uh, safeguard. Um, and um, but that's a problem because oftentimes that concept takes over the substance, the contentious terrain of the law, right? Thank you. Is there another question here? Okay. 
Just to take the point further then, I'm sorry to... Uh, no, no, quite all right. No, no, Let's no. go at it. That's great. Um, you said you live without guarantees, right, right? And you said, I think, that you live a very difficult life by living without guarantees. Does that entail that those people who fear they don't live a particularly difficult life in that sort of sense are creating artificial guarantees? Is that what you aim Well, doing? all guarantees are artificial. That's my argument. Meaning they're created by human beings. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying to, to, to say that... that well, I, delusionary I, are guarantees. Perhaps I, perhaps I should use the word instead of artificial, delusionary um, guarantees. Perhaps yes, I use the word delusion twice or maybe three times, and I realize it's a very strong word to use. Um, if we're going to not be moralistic about it, right, uh, and to say that there's some truth that we have to overcome, to, to, that would overcome delusion. Yes, I mean, in the sense that it would be a misperception to think that you are covered, uh, you have a safeguard, a transcendental safeguard, when you in fact don't. In that, only in that strict sense would we call it delusionary, not delusional, we don't want to go into a pathology, it's not a pathology issue. Uh, but all guarantees are artificial. That's the whole point. I'm, I, when I'm saying that, that uh, 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 you know, living life without guarantees, I'm not saying that, that no guarantees are ever put into effect because, because they have to be. This is back to the discussion about norms. But that, that they have to be understood to have been put there by us, not by some other entity. Um, and that they are provisional, meaning that just because we put them there doesn't mean also that we're done. Now we can go home. We created our guarantees and then we're done. Because then they become actually, else they go to an elsewhere. Was there, pardon? Right, right, right. Yes. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> that, that, that is, of course, the, the, and that would go back to, the, to the, the taxation in the sense that, of course, there is a society and we don't live in the jungle. But um, uh, because taxation really is about as archaic as anything. Um, but that, that, that would go back to the question about the tragic. There is, an, in this business, a, one limit that is really an insurmountable limit. And that is death. I mean, that's, that's sort of, that's the kind of thing that the tragic imagination that produced, you know, a certain kind of attitude towards the world and a certain kind of uh, uh, art, um, it, you know, takes, it takes to be the, the point of departure. That, that in, in, in the classic, uh, you know, the second uh, ode in Antigone, which is a really a wonderful text, incredible poetic text about the human being, and, and, the, uh, and Sophocles there says, um, that the human being, anthropos is the word, so it's not man, okay, it's really translated man, but it's not, it's not, it should not be gender. It's really, in Greek, it's really it's the human being. The human being is the most horrifying, the most capacious and horrifying being in the universe, more even than the gods. Um, there is no limit as to what the human being can do. Absolutely n no limit. It can do, and then there's, of course, a list of things, you know, except for one thing <laughs> that is a limit that is, in fact, something that a human being does not control, and that is death. And, and uh, so the whole issue here is, what do you do with a limitlessness while you're living? Because there is a limit that we all know is unavoidable. Uh, and, and that's my argument, is the more you understand the, the, uh, the, um, um, uh, the unavoidability of that limit, then you gain uh, more responsibility and a gr the stakes are raised even higher about the limitlessness within that limit, which is your life. And, it, and, and so, you know, it's very difficult to live in the limitlessness, even, even while knowing that at some point it will end and you'll be rested. You know, you know what I mean? So we create limits all the time. In, and that's what society is. It's, a lim it's, it's, a lim it's limits. So the question there is not that, that we don't create limits, but that we think about what it, these limits are. The fact that we create them and not something, something else. And, you know, so on and so forth. Then we become politically invested in them, which means we're accountable for them and so on and so forth. I was wondering whether I can ask a question, too, about uh, the term atheist. In many uh, respects, uh, 
uh, is a reformulation of the previous comments. The comment that uh, it's impossible, the two things that are impossible to avoid are uh, death and taxation, because <laughs> another way of um, um, uh, of phrasing that is that uh, uh, you know it's impossible uh, on the one hand to uh, not to think of ourselves in terms of existence and in terms of some kind of relation to the law, but. Um, um, I, I would like to uh, ask a question about atheism returning to the great atheist of the Western tradition, namely Baruch Spinoza. Uh, and uh, you defined your atheism as opposition to other forms of atheisms uh, in two uh, ways. Well, on the one hand, uh, precisely in terms of existence, you're not interested in the question about whether God exists or does not exist. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather, uh, you're interested uh, in the way that um, uh, uh, this allows, uh, the, the question of atheism allows for um, uh, a way of uh, thinking life and, uh, uh, and therefore uh, not, uh, and therefore encountering our own mortality as a kind of limit that, um, uh, that allows us uh, to, uh, um, uh, uh, in a sense, um, uh, make decisions and all these conditions of disbelief that you're talking about. Um, and uh, overcoming basically the sort of the miracle of resurrection that um, um, uh, holds together the whole structure of transcendence that you're referring to. Now, um, uh, it seems to me that um, that's a very Spinozan thought uh, uh, in ethics. Uh, 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 part four, proposition 72, uh, he famously says, a very famous proposition of his book, The Ethics, the free man uh, is uh, the man who thinks of uh, death least of all. Mm. Uh, therefore, in a sense, if there is an ethical imperative for Spinoza, it's precisely, precisely the, the imperative to, uh, the imperative for living instead of, um, of a discourse that mm -hmm. understands existence in terms of death. Uh, that's the first point. And the second point uh, that you, uh, the second way that you define your atheism, which again seems to me very uh, Spinozan, uh, is um, uh, in terms of the imperatives, in terms of the responsibilities that this condition of uh, disbelief um, uh, puts us in. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that was uh, one of the points that uh, Professor uh, Compridis uh, kind of highlighted, all the musts mm -hmm. that come with adopting this, this kind of privileging of the importance of living, of understanding life in terms of living mm -hmm. as opposed to, to a death. W how all these musts, in a sense, um, uh, can possibly be understood without recourse to normativity? Uh, well, it seems to me that a norm, although this is uh, the wrong word for uh, many reasons, but a kind of point of decision already exists, and uh, Spinoza talks about that. Uh, that uh, basically when we're faced in particular situations uh, with a decision about going for life or going for death, we're absolutely entitled to make the decision to go for life. If, you're, yes. if you encounter a robber in the middle of the night, he says in chapter 16 of the Theological Political Treatise, and he threatens your life, you're entitled, he says, you have the natural light to, right, to be deceitful. You, you have the natural light to, to lie in order to save your life. This is not a norm in the sense that it imposes external criteria, because the criteria are always derived from the particular circumstances that you find yourself in. So um, anyway, so there is these two meanings then of of of, of atheist mm -hmm. that uh, we we'll find in Spinoza, and it seems to me that your position is very similar. I was wondering whether yes, I mean you've I'm had not. A I mean you you that. know Spinoza uh, better than me overall, but I think that I wouldn't. Um, you know we've had this argument or partly this argument before. Uh, I'm not sure whether I would say that Spinoza is an atheist. I mean of course he, from a certain standpoint he is, but he, you know. For, for him, uh, I mean, yes, within the tradition of the the, the, the Judaic tradition, he's an atheist. Uh, but um, but he's but he could also be called a pantheist. So that's a very kind of problematic uh, coincidence, right? Um, so I don't know uh, whether so, so that I, I don't know if this is Spinoza what I'm doing. I think that. Uh, from a certain standpoint, the second part of your uh, observation is definitely closer. Yes, one opts for life. Um, 
Um, but, but I would disagree with Spinoza that, in fact, it is the, the free, if we're going to use his language, the freest man is precisely the one who thinks about death uh, without fear, but not the one who doesn't think about death. Because, because it, it's only in thinking about death, that's the tra that's, Spinoza is not a tragic thinker, actually. That would be another thing to say. Mm -hmm. But um, but that that would that would be that, that for me that's the point in which we can opt for life because otherwise what I want to avoid is uh, some kind of a self-preservation principle. I mean, you opt for life out of just sheer self-preservation, which all animals have. I mean, uh, although the human being is the most peculiar animal in regards to that because it doesn't really have a good as good of an instinct for self-preservation as other animals. Do. But let's say okay, um, so that's the that's the problem there with that phrase. I'm not sure I, I, I would agree with that phrase. Uh, but I, yes, I agree with the second part, that, in the, in the, that being so-called deceitful in situations where your life is threatened uh, is, in fact, uh, an essential um, response. But that's a matter of self-preservation. And it's not a norm. He, he's right. You're right. He's, he doesn't say that's a norm. Um, so that, I'd have to think more about, and I have to develop more, at least the, 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 in the discussion about miracles. Obviously, Spinoza has a lot to say that I, that I have not included in this piece that I will definitely have to, to go into more. Uh, maybe time for one final question. Yeah. Um, I feel like just echoing a question or a point that was raised by uh, your opposition here, and that was Please. to do with... Um, how do we all live together? I mean, yes, yes, uh, yeah, philosophy right. and society was the, the headline or the th central theme of this lecture series, and I felt that your presentation uh, didn't quite answer or even address that question. Um, um, I, I'm actually a bit surprised that you would posit um, a new form of atheism, uh, an atheism beyond atheism, if you like, when when the first form of atheism is already doing quite enough uh, to perpetuate uh, the conflicts and disagreements that are happening uh, in the world with religions. And um, uh, I'm probably not the only person in this room uh, who's left scratching my head with um, this presentation of yours because um, it, to, to me it's just, it's, it seemed like, a, like an exercise in intellectualization, acrobatics with words, particularly big ones. And... Um, Ultimately, didn't really um, give me any answers as to as to uh, the, the big question. Well, I'm um, sorry about that. I'm, that you didn't get the answers to big questions. But but uh, I I disagree with you profoundly that atheism is is the one that's producing havoc in this world. That's that's just not accurate. I mean, well, no, I mean the, you, that, no, it's an important point to make. It's not accurate. I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that a, um, I mean, my God, it's very hard to even argue that the, you know, you, you know, American imperialism is conducted on the basis of atheism. That's absurd. It's conducted on the basis of a certain kind of Christian and morality and a certain kind of uh, 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 investment in, in Christian superiority. There's nothing atheistic about uh, American imperialism. We're going to take, you know, the beast here as the object, okay? So that... So automatically, um, that part of your question is compromised by that comment. Now, you're right, though, to bring up the, the uh, and I'm glad you did, the, the, the issue about living together, which I, which, because I forgot to address that. Um, um, I'm very clearly against any liberal um, positions that are, uh, that espouse harmonious living together on some sort of, equal basis where everyone has some kind of guaranteed equal uh, right to existence. Okay? Because this, this, is, this is the principle in the name of which a great deal of destruction and subjugation of others has happened. Okay? Think about from what position can you, not you personally, okay, can, can you, can, can anyone, where can one stand to make, uh, to make that kind of argument that we, are, that we all must live together uh, as if we are somehow inherently equal. Where, in fact, we live in a world of extraordinary asymmetry of power and, 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 uh, and resources 
where, where we live in a world of, of continuous conflict. There's, it's a wonderful aspiration to imagine a world where there is no conflict. But frankly, there's never been a world without conflict in history. Okay? So it, the aspiration to be in a world without conflict is very nice and noble, but that's not the, the project. The project is to understand in what sense conflict uh, is not, um, uh, does not produce greater domination, okay? that does not produce greater asymmetry, or does not produce uh, um, a, a, a kind of world where um, one power consistently uh, um, you know, dominates the other. Um, it's a way of rethinking you know, the, the problem of conflict. So um, the lectures are, yes, philosophy and society. It's true that there wasn't much discussion of society 